Released in 1995 on the Game Boy, Kirby's Dream Land 2 is yet another platformer featuring the lovable pink puffball with a sensational appetite. Also returning is a similar structure. In the first game, Kirby needed to recover the sparkling star stolen by King DDD. The second game had Kirby retrieving the seven pieces of the star rod. Dream Land 2 has Kirby locating the seven rainbow drops, which will restore the rainbow bridge. The gameplay also remains largely unchanged. Kirby can inhale enemies and spit them back out as a projectile, can inhale air and float infinitely, and has a traditional jump. The trademark copy abilities are present and accounted for too. Rather than spitting enemies out, Kirby can digest them and utilize the defeated foe's abilities. The copy abilities have been streamlined quite a bit, with just seven being featured. Burning, Cutter, Ice, Needle, Parasol, Spark, and stone. Even with the smaller roster, I can't help but feel there are some redundancies though. For example, the burning ability launches Kirby horizontally, achieving the same damage range as the cutter. The cutter is less risky though, as Kirby can attack from a distance. The needle ability offers a similar conundrum. It turns Kirby into a nearly indestructible spiked ball. However, the spark ability offers the same effect, only it is not time limited. The needle ability is temporary. The spark lasts forever, so like many Kirby games, I'm left wondering why some abilities even exist. Still, bloat aside, the biggest addition to Kirby's Dream Land 2 are the animal friends. These offer Kirby some additional moves, as well as altering the copy abilities. Acquiring the animal friends is interesting though. Generally speaking, they have been kidnapped and locked in a sack. In order to free them, a mini boss representing one of the seven copy abilities must be defeated. Once this is accomplished, the animal friend is freed and Kirby can hitch a ride. Each offers a unique attribute for Kirby as well. Rick the hamster can walk normally on on ice, removing the slippery feel. Koo the owl can fly, letting Kirby attack in the air without dropping, and can fly through wind currents. Lastly, Kine the sunfish can swim efficiently underwater and allows Kirby to inhale while underwater, an effect not afforded to Kirby alone. Each animal friend also has their own life bar, giving the player an additional six hit points before the animal disappears. They are a nice enough addition to the Kirby formula, helping this third installment of the franchise feel somewhat fresh, despite not being much different than the previous games. Like Kirby's Adventure, there are little hub worlds with doors leading to each of the levels, unlocking sequentially and ultimately leading to a boss battle. The opening island, Grassland, has just three stages, while the final island, Dark Castle, has a whopping seven. The formula works, allowing new players to feel like they are quickly making progress as they breeze through the small islands, while the increased levels in later islands slow the pace down and build tension as the game nears the finish line. Speaking of finish line, Dreamland 2 features a good ending, with the seven rainbow drops being needed to actually unlock the final boss, and additional content needed to finally achieve a 100%. This is a fairly large game, considering the hardware. Being a 1995 first party release, Kirby's Dream Land 2 takes full advantage of the Super Game Boy, with custom color palettes for each level, additional colors on the HUD, and some nice looking stills. On paper, Kirby's Dream Land 2 checks off all of the right boxes. A streamlined ability set, a new gimmick with animals, a familiar platforming game structure with hub worlds, and a progressing difficulty curve, boss battles ending each island, and two final bosses. As always, the music is light and easy to listen to, Kirby retains his trademark charm, and there is a battery back save. Kirby's Dream Land 2 is void of anything overly frustrating or cheap, keeping the game appealing and approachable for gamers of all skills levels. Perhaps this is why the game is often regarded as one of the best Game Boy games of all time, as well as dominating in unscientific fan polls. Of course, I'm not about to give Kirby's Dream Land 2 a free pass and declare it a must-play classic. My biggest gripe with Kirby's Dream Land 2 is how often a player can simply fly through a level and ignore virtually everything the designers designed. Of course, Kirby isn't the only game offering game-breaking flight abilities, with Super Mario World World at times falling into the same trap. The ability to fly so effortlessly has the side effect of dissuading the player from wanting to bother with the animal friends in the first place. Rick the hamster and Kine the sunfish are unable to fly, making them feel somewhat nerfed in normal circumstances. It strikes me as odd that some
something a player has to work to acquire and keep doesn't feel as powerful as the standard character. To be fair, at times the designers seem to try and limit abuse. The water stages are the most obvious. Here, enemy and hazard placement prevents the player from cheesing the level, forcing proficient play. Vertical elements also work in conjunction with the flight power, giving a stage format which complements Kirby's skill set. Still, there are far too many moments where the player can skip large portions of the game without any sort of skill, timing, or precision, which I think is a shame. Exploring the balance of the power-ups is worthy of discussion as well. For example, in the cutter versus burning debate, a speedrunner might argue the fire power-up acts as a dash, allowing the player faster forward speed in exchange for a lack of safety when the dash ends. The parasol can be used to attack above, the only power-up to function this way, but is generally a slow power-up to use. A decent trade-off in power versus speed, in addition to offering a unique ability unlike any of the others. On the flip side, the ice power-up freezes enemies, with the frozen block created offering a projectile which can move clear across the screen. I guess the two-step process is a good exchange for the distance provided, but the designers rarely took advantage of this distance boost. The worst power-up is the rock, which is only useful in a couple of scripted areas, but is otherwise a terrible power-up. To be fair, the developers did create destructible blocks which can only be cleared by using a corresponding power-up. As noted, there is a rainbow drop hidden on each rainbow island. In addition to finding the room containing the drop, the player must have the right ability equipped to break blocks housing the drops. Oftentimes, the player will not have the right ability equipped, and some experimentation and revisits with different power-ups will be needed to break them. But this leads to my next question. Why? Breaking blocks and obtaining the rainbow drops is needed to reach the final boss in the game and get the real ending. If one doesn't do this, the game ends after defeating in King DDD, and the end credits tease the player with a question mark after the word end, signifying the adventure is not really over. Instead, a player needs to use trial and error to figure out what abilities break what blocks. The parasol is needed to break these blocks, but the shape and pattern on the block doesn't offer the player a clue as to what might break it. The spike power-up breaks the dice block, okay? The rock power-up breaks the companion cube. Again, what? Granted, the flame melting ice blocks does make sense, but I feel like teaching moments are sorely lacking in Kirby's Dream Land 2. They are not absent, however. The second level in Cloudy Park demonstrates some good design. The opening segment has one enemy with an ability, Master Pengy, giving Kirby the ice ability. As enemies respawn, the player has literally no option but to use the ability to break open special blocks. One can't help but wonder why these teaching moments aren't used for each block type, eliminating trial and error as a means to beating the game. There are some other teaching moments to be found as well. The second stage of Ripple Field contains a good one. There is a mid-boss fight against Master Green, and defeating him rewards not only the spark ability, but also Kind the Sunfish. A first-time player would likely equip both the ability and the animal friend to see what the combination yields. After exiting the room, stars are immediately visible, which a player will want to grab as seven will reward an extra life. The player is taught Kind can swim through fast current, a skill needed later in the adventure. The power-up also lights up darkened rooms, with the first having a secret door. Again, a skill needed later. This is good design. Same goes for Iceberg Stage 2. The stage opens with wind, which forces the player into the far door of the stage. And here, a mid-boss battle against Jumper Shoot and a captive Koo. Koo's ability to penetrate wind current is needed to reach the second door missed earlier, teaching the player one of Koo's skills, which is again needed later. It is clear the designers had the player experience in mind when designing some stages and developing some mechanics. I just wish this level of care was put into the block breaking mechanic needed to finish the game. If the rainbow drops were just a completion bonus, like the large switches in Kirby's Adventure, I wouldn't mind so much. Instead, their obtuse nature feels more like the original Rayman, which required the player to locate every single cage with often cryptic locations to unlock the final boss battle and finally beat the game. 
Moving on, I should talk about the overall presentation. As noted earlier, Kirby's Dream Land 2 takes full advantage of the Super Game Boy. Unlike the first Dream Land, which had just a single custom palette for the entire game, Dream Land 2 has a custom palette for each stage, even changing when a player enters through a door. As Kirby is trying to restore the Rainbow Bridge, it makes sense that each of the seven islands contains one of the seven colors of the rainbow. Grassland features yellow, Big Forest, green, Ripple Field, cyan, Iceberg, blue, Red Canyon, red, Cloudy Park, orange, and finally, Dark Castle, violet. While clever, this has the unfortunate side effect of making Kirby's Dream Land 2 feel monochromatic as just one shade of color is generally available at a time, versus Kirby's Dream Land which features four distinct colors. Minor quibble aside, Dream Land 2 is still a fine looking Game Boy game. The artists did a nice job using the four colors available to create sprites and tiles that both offer high contrast, but also subtle shading. Background and foreground elements have shadows and highlights, giving a sense of depth, but it is restrained enough to prevent the levels from feeling cluttered and allow Kirby and the enemies to stand out. Per usual, Kirby is well animated, with his body squishing in the appropriate way as he runs into various platforms, and the game is chock full of animations thanks to the many copy abilities. This holds true with the animal friends as well. They are large and detailed, with distinct facial features and animated limbs. And of course, they too are loaded with various animations thanks to the copy abilities. I guess the best way to describe the graphics of Kirby's Dream Land 2 would be polished. The style is terrific, creating something distinctly Kirby despite the low resolution and limited colors, and also technically excellent, with tons of animations and variety, with less slowdown than what the series has featured up to this point. And of course, the splash of color with the Super Game Boy is the icing on the cake. Technical and artistic polish is also present in the soundtrack. While some tracks carry over from the previous title, there is new music as well. First, each of the animal friends has the their own music when equipped. Thankfully, unlike Link's Awakening, the hijack soundtrack is actually pleasing. Kai and the Sunfish has a laid-back island track suitable for a tropical creature. Rick the Hamster's theme is more upbeat, matching the high energy of the tiny hyper rodent. Lastly, Koo the Owl has perhaps the best track of them all, with an energetic western mashup with a fast drum track and drawn-out whistle, almost blending the serenity of a gliding owl with the fast-paced nature of flapping wings. The new level Level tracks aren't so bad either, and it does feel like the composers were trying to squeeze as many different musical genres as they could out of the aging 8-bit hardware, while keeping the energy high and the overall tone bouncy. Except for the boss music. The boss track is bassier than the rest, I assume to give a more menacing tone to these massive beasts. However, the composition is boring. It seems like it is building towards something, but then the chorus never comes. It is a rare blemish in what is an otherwise acoustic treat. Speaking of bosses, I have extremely mixed opinions on these. Wispy Woods returns yet again with a new root attack pattern to avoid, but is otherwise the same fruit projectile fight it has always been. Not difficult, but a decent first boss. Ruff has the player inhaling Nellies to launch as projectiles. The difficulty is increased with multiple platforms, and Kirby cannot drop through the platforms while retaining a projectile, adding a bit of strategy to the fight, helping it feel a little more fleshed out than the first game. Sweet Sweet stuff is a fish boss, but as you can see from the footage, the player can bring a copy ability to boss fights. Kine with Spark offers a devastating combo that all but breaks this boss encounter. In fact, most of the bosses can be cheesed pretty hard with any projectile attack, which is disappointing. The Ice Dragon continues the trend of increasing difficulty, with the player needing to avoid dropping spikes while simultaneously sucking them up for attacking. However, if one brought an ability, the strategic 
magic element would be lost. Even Krakow is expanded, with two complete phases to learn. The battle against King DDD is remarkably similar to the first Dreamland, sadly, and as one can see here, the same basic ability abuse removes the challenge. And this is what bums me out about Kirby's Dreamland 2 the most. The designers crammed lots of stuff into the game, but I don't feel like they always realized how different environments, enemies, and hazards would interact with all of this stuff. What I love about the original Super Mario Brothers is how every platform and enemy felt deliberate, like the designers thought about every possible way a player might race through a level and make sure the design would compensate, enhance, and accentuate the skill of the player and Mario's unique movement. It is wonderful and helps the game feel tight and polished to this day. When I play Kirby's Dream Land 2, I feel like that level of care is missing. The focus of the game isn't on tight platforming, Kirby can float after all, but rather the focus is on experimenting with different copy abilities and animals and enjoy the sense of discovery when new combinations are tested. Unfortunately, sometimes the combination isn't good, and rather than feeling wonder and joy, I just feel like the game is wasting my time. Now, I realize I've probably been a bit harsher on Kirby's Dream Land 2 than most, and I don't want to give the impression I dislike this game, or that it is even bad. I actually enjoy this game quite a bit, and Dreamland 2 is not bad. For one, Kirby's controls are tight and responsive. Be it running, jumping, floating, or falling, Kirby responds immediately to button inputs, and I'm starting to appreciate using the up button to initiate a float. Kirby doesn't have a double jump, and I dig the fact the float ability isn't treated as such. I'm also not sure if I'm just used to the game at this point or if there are some control tweaks, but I rarely found myself in that awkward situation of attempting to change directions and quickly inhale, only to find the direction change didn't register and Kirby is facing the wrong way. Again, I don't know if the actual game code has been updated and improved, or if something else is going on here, but I did find Kirby to be more responsive as a whole. I also dig some of the randomness present in the mid-boss and end-boss encounters. The bosses won't always attack in the same way, meaning there aren't as many safe spots on the screen like in Dreamland 1. It also helped keep the game fresh after battling the same mid-bosses repeatedly through the seven islands. Finally, I especially love the difficulty progression. Kirby's Dreamland 2 is not a hard game by any stretch. The insane abundance of extra lives available, from the end of the level minigame to the low star collecting required means the player will rarely, if ever, receive a game over. And there are unlimited continues, assuring players of all skill levels, with enough persistence, will beat this one, which I like. But Dreamland 2 does a nice job of getting more difficult with each passing world. Auto-scrolling levels become far more prevalent, meaning the threat of getting crushed and dying is real. More corridors are presented which force players to deal with enemies and hazards, rather than float above them. It isn't always present, but I do like how the game gets more challenging, increasing engagement and helping to reduce boredom. As we near the end of the video, I should probably get back to actually beating the game. As noted, unless a player locates and obtains the seven rainbow drops, they will receive the bad ending. Some of the drops actually do a wonderful job using the unique animal friend and copy ability combos. Kine is needed to fight a current, preventing access to a hidden door for an ill-equipped player. The iceberg rainbow drop is on the opposite end of the spectrum, requiring the use of Kine on an auto-scrolling ice level, which is awkward and needing the player to quickly drop the burning power-up, suck up and remove blocks before the power-up disappears. This was a colossal chore on my first playthrough, as the timing is insanely strict, but after tons of failure, I was able to do this quickly on my recorded run. The Red Canyon one is also challenging, but in a good way. Rick the Hamster and the Spark power-up are an awesome combo, with Rick firing out an electric wave which starts above him, which is handy on a vertically screen scrolling stage, and almost mandatory to find the secret door containing the rainbow drop. However, my favorite is Cloudy Park. It is here where I feel the true potential of Kirby, the animal friends, and the copy abilities are finally realized. The player starts with Kine, which is admittedly not intuitive, but necessary to fight the current leading to a secret door. Inside is a fight against Master Green, with the needed spark ability. Next, the player needs to obtain Rick the Hamster in another mid-boss 
fight. Well, this isn't mandatory, but makes the next part a ton easier. With Spark and Brick, two blocks can be destroyed, which frees up Ku. Ku is required to fight past the wind in the next segment. At this point, the Spark ability isn't needed, although it is also borderline broken in some situations. But rather, the Cutter ability is needed to break the blocks hiding another rainbow drop. It is a brilliant level as the player is forced to copy the ice ability to progress past the first section, meaning one can't just bring the cutter and skip the rainbow drop. All of the animals are used to their full potential, and the copy abilities are used like breadcrumbs or clues as to what to do next. I absolutely love this, and if more of Dreamland 2 was this methodical and thoughtful, I feel the game would be much better. But alas, this is a rare moment to never be repeated again. Wrapping things up, collecting the rainbow drop and beating Dark Matter will not reward 100% on a player's save file. To complete this game proper, the player will need to revisit the first six boss doors and play a star collecting minigame. These are tough, and one mistake will automatically fail the player. But beating each, along with finding a random female GUI, will complete the quest, unlocking a boss rush, bonus rush, and a sound test. Not a bad reward for going the extra mile. Overall, Kirby's Dream Land 2 is a fine game, a good game even. The controls are crisp, the difficulty curve is excellent, and the adventure is filled to the broom with charm and polish. And I also appreciate the approachable nature the designers have always used with the series thus far. However, I do find messing about with the power-ups trying to decipher how to break a block to be a bit obtuse, and the game doesn't even have a door marker alerting a player as to which stages even have a rainbow drop in them, like Adventure did with the big switches. It makes actually beating the game and getting the proper ending more of a chore than it should be. And of course, I find myself disappointed with the copy abilities, animal friends, and the sometimes thoughtless and disappointing combinations they provide, making experimenting feel tedious rather than fun. The level design also feels pedestrian, with far too many moments lacking real player input. It doesn't ruin the game by any stretch, and I'll take moments of monotony over pure frustration any day, but I do find it hard to declare this game great. At the end of the day, this is a Kirby game. The initial playthrough is fun, but the fun is diminished with each playthrough as more game-breaking moments are discovered and abused. While not a great game, Kirby's Dream Land 2 is still charming, polished, approachable, and good.